All right. This picture you see before you right now has nothing to do with this video. It actually has to do with a video I'm going to be making very shortly, but I wanted to make an admed admedum, an addition to the video that you're about to watch about free will here. And uh, the Calvinistic point of view where the only will that actually is fulfilled is God's will. And I just want you to think about a couple things. If you're a Calvinist or you believe their belief about not having free will. Adam and Eve were created perfect. So how did they sin if they don't have free will unless it was God's will that they sin? And if it's God's will that they sin, not their own, how can they be punished for that? It just doesn't make any sense, right? But I've been talking to this uh, Calvinist fellow on one of my videos on BitChute, and he was saying that you are already destined to make your choices that God already knows you're going to make in the future. They're, they're already set. God already knows them. You're going to make those choices. And I was just like, yeah, no shit. How can you be destined to do anything other than your own free choice? Or else it wouldn't be a free choice, now would it? Of course, in the future, I'm going to do my will through choices within the limitation of my ability and the choices that I have and the knowledge that I have, right? So how can you be bound to anything else other than your own will? And your own choice. You're going to be destined to make your choices. And you're going to follow your choices. Well, no shit. That's what free will is. Even if God already knows the choices I'm going to make in the future. How can I be bound to anything other than my choice anyway? If it, I wasn't, then I wouldn't have free will. I'd be a robot just doing what I was programmed to do. And... God could change that programming nilly-willy. But everything's set because those are the choices I'm going to make when I make them. Right? Just like the choices I've made in the past were the choices I've made because that's what I decided to do at that time. And the choices I'm making right now are choices that I'm deciding to do right now. Right? I'm following my free will, even though God already knows what I'm going to do right now. Doesn't take away my free will. Right? At any moment, I could change to follow my will or even go against my will to prove that I have free will. Right? I, I can do these things because God has given me free will. But I just wanted to put that in there uh, because this whole thing about not having free will is nonsense. It really is. It's just a way to divert guilt and blame from yourself. Just like when Adam was caught and when he will, willfully sinned, what did he do? It's not my fault. It's the woman's fault that you created and gave me. It's her. And then God looks at Eve and goes, hey, is this true? And then Eve is like, it's not me. No, 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 no. It was the serpent that you made and it beguiled me. You did this. You see how sin gets us to divert blame, and ultimately, what were they doing? Blaming God. No, 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 it's your fault, God, because you created this woman. I didn't, you did. And it, it, No, 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 you, you created the serpent. I didn't, it's your fault. And that's exactly what Calvinism is doing. It's not me. It's you. You created me like this. You made me do it. It's so annoying. I have been getting real sick of it, as you can tell. But anyway, thanks for watching. And uh, now the video is going to start. Just a little. Whoop. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? 
So the fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved, but you're not saved. You're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about God's plan and free will. Because I have a very persistent Calvinist commenting on uh, my videos on BitChute and is really insistent that it can only be one or the other. Either God set everything up so there's no actual free will. You're, you're stuck in whatever it is God created, basically like a computer program where you, you're playing some video game. There is a set ending where all the characters are going to do what they are programmed to do they don't have free will type to divert from that right so they're going to do what it is they're going to do and that's that because if you have choice you can disrupt the whole plan right so either again no free will, God set everything up, or when you make a free will choice, you catch God off by surprise, and he's like, oh, wow, what's going on here? What's this about? Right? And this fella obviously doesn't know the power of God to be able to know you, know you very well, not only knowing you very well, but knows the future because he's not bound by time. Like right now, he's looking here, watching me do this video. But he also sees my past, he's also seeing my future, and he's also seeing you, your present, your past, and your future all at once, right? So he knows all the choices you've made in the past, he knows what you're thinking and the choice you're going to make now, and he knows your future and the choices you're going to make then. This does not take away your free will, and I, I wanted to talk about that a bit. Because your free will is obviously limited. Uh, an example would be you can choose whether to jump or not to jump. And when you do jump, you may be able to choose how high you jump within reason. Reason of your ability. Because you might not be able to jump just a millimeter off the ground. Like that's, you're not able to get that precise. Maybe you can go a little hop where you get like a half inch off the ground. That's like as low as you can get. You try to get where you barely get off the ground. But... No, with your muscle memory and your focus, all you can do is manage to jump like a half inch off the ground. But then with all your might, you, you jump 12 inches off the ground, right? A whole foot up in the air. It, but that's limited, right? Because if you wanted to jump just a paper thin slice in the air, just to show that you could, to show your skill, you, you couldn't do it, right? It's not in your ability. And then if you wanted to jump two feet in the air, you can't do that, right? So you have the free will to choose between limitation, between a half an inch and a foot. You can control how high you jump between that range. So you got free will, but it's obviously boxed in, right? Such as you can lift weights. You can lift as little as a pound, but maybe when it comes to lifting, you can only, uh, let's say, curl up to a 100-pound bar, right? So you can curl as little as a, a 1 pound to 100 pounds. But if you wanted to curl more, that's beyond your ability to do. But you have the free will to curl as much as you want between that weight. But anything more than that, you're just too, too heavy. And anything less than that, let's just say it doesn't exist. There's nothing lighter than that, right? So that's where you're limited. 
And just because you have a limited choice doesn't mean there isn't choice, right? That's just how it is. Kind of like you have a choice here in this life to either come and meet God at the cross, to know him and be known of him, and to start that relationship with God, or you cannot and reject God. But you cannot choose to be God and to stand as your own as God and become God yourself and create your own universe, right? You don't have that ability. You do not have that in your range of possibilities, right? You may think to want to do that. If you had the ability to make that choice, you may want to do it. Just like if you had the ability to, to curl 3,000 pounds, you may choose to do that, right? Because you want to show that you're strong. Or if you could jump 10 feet in the air, you would want to show that, right? If you had the choice. So you're able to think of things that you would do if you were able to do it. Again, showing, you know, free will, right? But, of course, you're you're kind of boxed in. And that's just how it is. There's nothing you can do about it. you got to take what's given to you and make the best of it. And that's why I have these illustrations here of choose your own adventure books. Because it, it's a perfect example where you are given a book. And like it says on these books, it says... 19 possible endings, 40 possible endings, 26 possible endings, 27 possible endings. And if you're not familiar with these books, these books are kind of cool. I remember checking them out when I was young. And it would basically start out with you reading a chapter, the first chapter, obviously, and such as let's use this one. And you're going scuba diving, right? And then at the end of the chapter, it would say, Okay, now you could choose to continue scuba diving. If you do, go to chapter two. But if you choose to stop and go back to the hotel, jump to chapter five. And then based on your choice, there's a different thing set up for you. But it's all also predetermined, predestined, right? And this is exactly what we have in life. God sets before us life itself where we have it. And then he says, okay, do you want to continue life? Do you want to stay in life? Do you want all the things that I can offer you, which is life, love, peace, joy, happiness, your desires fulfilled? I can give you all these things. Or do you choose death? Because if you reject God, you get the opposite of what God is. Death, hatred, misery, unsatisfaction, right? You're going to get the opposite of what God is. You get to freely make that choice. Now, you get to make that choice. It's like coming to one of these books. You read the first chapter and it says, oh, do you want to go meet God at the cross? If you do, jump to chapter such and such. Oh, you don't want to meet God? Jump to chapter such and such. But at the end of each chapter, if you reject God, let's say, they'll, at the end of every chapter you come to, it's going to say, do you want to come to the cross now or do you want to continue rejecting God? And you can keep rejecting God by your own free will, but it's predetermined what's going to happen to you. And then by the last chapter, you have one more chance because it's before you die. Are you going to come to the cross to meet God, or are you going to reject him? And if you choose to reject him, you're, there's only two endings to this book. Well, then you are cast out, separated from God, so you get the opposite of God. But then if you choose to accept God, then you have that predetermined destination to be with God forever. But it's all based on your free will. And just because your choices are limited does not mean you don't have choice. Right? Just because it's not a third option doesn't mean you don't have free will. Because you're using the free will to complain about there not being a third option, that you want a different choice. Right? Showing you got free will and that you don't even want to make the choice because you could choose not to make the choice and then the choice is going to be made for you. Right? Because... If you're not accepting God, God's not going to make you. So by default, 
you're choosing to reject him, right? So by not making the choice, the choice is to reject God, right? So you kind of make an indirect choice. But it all shows, again, free will and choice. And also when it comes to the, like a book like this, it shows that it's already been planned out. The story has already been told, but you just get to choose your role in it. That shows the power of God where he is outside of the book. He's in control. He's outside of time. He knows you very well. And I don't know about you, but you have probably got to know somebody very well, whether it's father, mother, brother, sister, friend, spouse, children, where you know their choice, right? You you don't know the future. You don't know exactly that they're going to make that choice, but you know them so well that, oh, if my wife was given a choice between chocolate or vanilla ice cream, I know she's for, without a doubt, she's going to accept chocolate or vanilla, right? You just know your spouse so well, you know what one they're going to choose, or you know if they don't like ice cream or allergic, you know they're going to politely reject it, right? You know what they're going to do, right? Because you know them. But you see, God knows us as well to set up a plan for, for all of us. But he also can see the future. And he knows the choices you're going to make. This doesn't set the, the choice in stone as if God made the choice for you. It just shows what you're going to choose. You When the time comes... God knows that choice because you're going to make that choice because you freely are going to choose to do that or not to do that, right? It's kind of like if you were able to invent a time machine, not where you travel in time, but you could see in time. So you could look back at the past. You could look into the future. And if you decided to look into the future, you could look into the future of yourself or people close to you or anybody, right? So you could look into the future and you could see the consequences of the choices we make today and then you could see people's choices that they make because of the consequences of the choices they made today and you can see the future of everybody's free will choice and you can even see your future and what you're going to do based on the effect looking into the future had on you because you looking into the future is going to affect you but God know you are going to do that you took a look at it and because of that effect, it changed some choice, right? Where if you didn't look into the future, maybe you would have chose something different in the future. But since you were looking into it, you made a different choice, right? But since all of this is based on our free will and has already been planned out, it's basically as if there's a line drawn from each chapter to what chapter in this book here that you're actually going to read. Because God already knows you. He knows your choices. So it's basically, he can line it out to look like, oh, this is exactly what you're going to do. I know it. And it's as if you don't have free will. Because it's already set there. But it's set there because as you're living right now, you could be like, I'm done with this video. You made a choice not to finish, to reject the fact that we have free will, and go about, about your life, right? Or you accept, yeah, we have free will. And just because God knows it doesn't mean we don't have it. I mean, knows our choice doesn't mean we don't have free will. It's just like when they talk about we're predestined. And it's like, yeah, these books are predestined. Where you have 19 possible endings. It's predestined. You don't have 20. You don't have 67. It's predetermined. But you still make choices to get to which one is going to be your ending. Right. And they leave out that the Bible says we're predestinated based on God's foreknowledge. Because God knows something before it happens. And that is your choice. And he knows that there's two options to accept him or to reject him. And if you accept him, you're predestined to heaven. If you reject him, you're predestined to hell. This does not take away your free will. It's not as if, because God knows this, that you you don't get to make any choices. Just because your choice is known. Just like I was saying, if you were able to look in the future, 
and you knew what your wife or husband was going to choose in the future, just because you know this doesn't mean they didn't choose it by their own free will, right? It's just by the time to they by the time they get to that point that you saw in the future. They're going to decide to make that choice by based on whatever it is that's going on in their heart and mind there, right? But, uh, yeah, uh, I think I made the point clear here, uh, but I'm sure I'll still get arguments about how we don't have free will because God knows our choice, and it just doesn't make sense. It's like, so you, you, so you know the future, that means there's no choice? Well, you can't change the future. So, uh, look at it this way. I, I know the Bible. So, I know the future. I can't change the future. That Does that mean I don't have free will? No. It means God says, this is what's going to happen. And even if you know it's going to happen, it's still going to happen. You can fight against it, but... Perhaps you're fighting against it is what creates it to help it along, right? I mean, you're like, I'm just going to ignore it. Well, that was part of the plan. God knew you were going to ignore it, and you ignoring it helps it actually come along. Or he knew that when you, you saw the future, you were going to help it along. And that's what ends up actually fulfilling his plan. He knew when... You saw the future, you would push for it and help it along. Right? So, uh, that just shows the power of God. Where you can have billions upon billions of individuals making their own free will choices, but it all fits into his plan that he already has played out. Where there's nothing that's surprising God, there's nothing that he can't handle. He, he already saw this coming, and he already prepared for it, right? There's nothing to worry about. It's all in his hands, but you still have free will, and you having free will does not overpower God's will or his plan. It's part of his plan, and ultimately, to deny the free will is to blame God. Because if you do not have free will, you're stuck and determined to do what you're doing, you're predestined to do that, well then God created you to do that. He made you that way to do what you did. So even if you went so far as to do horrible things to children where you have sexually harmed them and sacrificed them to whatever people sacrifice these children to, God made you do it because he predetermined it. And then he's going to punish you for what he programmed you to do because you don't have your own free will. So you see, the only choice is you have free will and you're responsible for your sins so you deserve to be punished for your sins. Or you don't have free will and it's God's fault and he should be punished for either your sins because he made you do it because you're a robot with no free will. Because we can look at it in ways that make sense to us. If we create a robot, and we create a robot specifically designed to kill children, anybody under the age of 12, anybody who's 11 or younger, this robot can tell how old you are, some special programming and sensors, and it will just kill you by any way it can, like a Terminator, right? The easiest way it can figure out, it will, it just kills them. Now, imagine bringing that robot to court and then trying it for murder and saying it knows better. It knows that murdering is wrong, but it still does it, right? We're going to punish it. And we're going to make it be able to feel pain and suffering. And we're going to make that robot feel pain and suffering forever because it did what we programmed it to do, which was to do evil. And you can see how that doesn't make any sense. That's evil because we made the robot do it. It was programmed to do it. And then we're going to make it suffer forever for what we made it do. But it had no free will of its own. So why are we going to torture it unless we ourselves are evil? 
you see, the Calvinistic point of view makes God out to be evil and makes man out to be more moral and merciful and gracious than God, more understanding than God. That's why Calvinism is evil, because it portrays God in a wrong way, whereas our whole job as Christians is to know God and to have God be known. They are not doing that. And, uh, yeah, I think there was one other thing I was going to bring up, I'm trying to remember what that was, making God out to be evil for making you do it, oh, the whole robot thing, robots, uh, that's exactly our future, they're making all kinds of different robots, a little bit off subject, but just to keep in mind, like with uh, somebody who's a police officer or a soldier, they could know the law and you could talk to them about their lack of jurisdiction. You can reason with fellow humans, right? And they may not want to follow the government and to do what the government tells them to do what concerning harm to the citizens, to the people of the nation. But they're making more and more advanced robots and you're not going to be able to reason with them right and they're going to not understand or care when you say you don't have jurisdiction they have no right they don't care they're going to do what they're programmed to do and they're going to force things on you hurt you kill you and that's that they don't care they don't feel any pity or remorse or guilt and you cannot bring a robot to trial and punish it. It has no free will or anything like that. And that's basically how Calvinists are trying to make us out to be. Like that. And because of that, they feel special. Because they're a chosen robot. They're going to be saved. They're a vessel of God's glory. And you're not, so they're better than you. Because if you weren't uh, where you are, then uh, God would have uh, made you like they are, better, right? He obviously chose the best ones, and they were chosen, so they're the best ones. It's a religion of puffing up man and man's ego and arrogance and a degrading of God and his character. And this is why, again, I hate Calvinism. It's evil. Just awful. But I know God uses everyone, even these people, because they, they still, in a way, preach the gospel. So, God willing, Calvinists, even in their unbelief, even in their rebellion, even in their self-exaltation, I pray God does use them to get the gospel to the world so that genuine people, they're going to come to the gospel and be saved in spite of the BS that is Calvinism. But uh, with all that being said, thanks for watching and take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2 it says looking on to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith and this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith an author is somebody who writes and in Romans chapter 10 Verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God 
in our world. It's God's representative in our world, and that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah, just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written to search the scriptures, bring them up. They testify of me, right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he's, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so, because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word, and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name. They're prophesying in his name. They're casting out devils in his name. They're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as... Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though what he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass. And all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying, this guy's not a Christian. You never listen to a thing I say because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking, 
and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. And just instead of saying crap or but, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tie. Didn't tie. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? <laughs> didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.